Olympics already far outstripped the UN's ability to police them. Even the left-leaning The Atlantic magazine wrote an article in 2013, The Forest Mafia, How Scammers Steal Millions Through Carbon Markets. Yet, while these failures are well known throughout the climate community, the climate crisis elite happily advances this racket without even a flinch, playing the part of world saviors, attending their lavish confabs, all the while using a well-established scam to behave like decadent royalty. So even though we are all well aware of the fact that the global warming climate change crisis is a hoax, it's instructive to observe how the globalists running this fraud delight in devouring their own. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. Well, stick around because right after the break, we're going to talk about the White House's stunning admission that the war on drugs has been an absolute failure. David Knight will be joining me in studio to break that down. And then we're also going to talk about Cy Hirsch's expose, the military actively going behind Obama's failed policy on the war in Syria. The Federal Reserve is a private banking cartel. The yeah, Fed is a sometimes very independent uh, organization. What should be the proper relationship between the chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? The Federal Reserve is an independent agency. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. They print our money and then loan it to us at interest. The IRS is their collection agency. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Jeff Duncan says he saw IRS special agents using semi-automatic rifles at a gun range. Now he wants answers to why the agency needs that type of firepower. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world? The central bankers in charge. Know your history and you will know your enemy. Infowars.com. I'm not gonna sit here and take it anymore. You guys have the exclusive for, which is a product called Deep Cleanse. And why I'm so excited about it is it's a unique formula, almost like the iodine crystals. We have two unique products that nobody in the world has. One of the most amazing ingredients in the world, and it's called Shilajit. And it's actually known as blood of the mountain or rock sweat because thousands of years ago, as a matter of fact, this ingredient was only given to the elite of the elite. Thousands of years ago, up in the Himalayan mountains and in Tibet. And we wanted to put this in, in stuff for, for a couple of years, but we couldn't get an organic form. Right. I mean, so I, let's explain. I mean, we, this stuff's so good, we couldn't put it out for years. Right. So I had to actually, it's kind of like the iodine crystals, finding a source deep in the earth that we could get the cleanest source available. But in Tibet and in Nepal and in the Himalayan mountains, Thousands of years ago, they found, they watched these monkeys. And during the summer months, the monkeys would go up into the mountains. Now you're being racist against monkeys. And they would pick this black substance from the mountains. And so uh, in Russia, they actually, it, it, it grows in Russia in the mountains and in the Himalayas and only in the summer. And Chilajit is actually the decomposition of seven, up to 7,000 different medicinal herbs. So it decomposes, all these different herbs decompose in the Himalayan mountains and the volcanic soil up there. And what happens in the summertime... So it's almost like an oil up, from... Yes, it's high in fulvic acid, it's high in humic acid. Because they're, they're always claiming down. oil is really from decomposed animals and plants. There is some oil that is based from fossils, but most of it's really abiotic. But so, so this is a true fossil uh, source. I mean, explain it to me. It is. A, it's really the decomposition, like I said, of over seven thousand different medicinal herbs and plants. And it, and with the rocks and the pressure deep in the mountains, it freezes and. And during the summertime, and the pressures build it up, it oozes out. It oozes out. So it literally oozes out of the mountain. It's like rock sap. It's like rock sap. It's black, and it's highly nutritious. Uh, even in the 1980s, when the Olympic athletes in Russia were accused of being on steroids, they found out that they were actually been given shalajit because it it works as an anabolic as well. 
and it builds muscles. It's a big dose in there. The second big main ingredient in there is a volcanic zeolite concentrate. And this, what this formula is designed to do, the shilajit and the zeolites have a real strong negative charge. All the metals and chemicals and PCBs and VOCs have positive charges. So these go in, they grab it, and then they safely eliminate it through the body so you can become healthy. I mean, the, this is an amazing formula. I wish I actually had it, but because this was an exclusive InfoWars Life product, you're the only one in the world that has this formula now. And, uh, you know, there is going to be a limited supply available when you sell out because you can only harvest this once a year. How do people take it? How is it recommended that this be done? Just a daily, daily dose? Yeah, daily dose. Uh, the instructions are on the label. You know, of course, I, I kind of modify it for each individual. It depends on what your lifestyle is. I mean, the, honestly, the best thing to do is for you to avoid all these chemicals and toxins in your environment and try to identify them and start slowly reducing them. But personally, I, I'm going to probably take it every day, every other day, and I'll probably go with about a dropper full to maybe two dropper fulls. Uh, and I and I, li I don't expose myself to any chemicals. InfoWarsLife.com. Please also support our local AM and FM affiliates, support their local sponsors or become a sponsor, and spread the word. Because these aren't just great products. This is how we fund this independent operation. We're not taxpayer-funded like MSNBC or NPR, and neither is your local station. So support them, folks. This is a war. <laughs> Well, the White House made a stunning admission this week. They actually admitted that a decades-old program, the War on Drugs, is an abject failure. Now, this is coming from the nation's top drug official. This is Michael Botticelli. Uh, he's the White House's director of Office of National Drug Control Policy. And he went on CBS's 60 Minutes on Sunday, proclaiming the War on Drugs a failure and calling for reform and a refocus of the drug policy. Now joining me in studio is David Knight. And David, this has been an issue that has been really a hot topic for you for decades, actually. Yeah, I, 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 because I've seen a lot of how it has failed. And he talks about a little bit of the failure. Let's play this clip because he, they referred to him as a drug czar and they said, that's not a title you like, is it? Let's hear what he had to say. Michael Botticelli is the president's new drug czar. Just don't call him that. It's actually a title that I don't like. Why? Um, because I think it connotes this old war on drug focus to the work that we do. It portrays that we are clinging to kind of failed policies and failed practices in the past. Are you saying that the way we have waged the war on drugs for more than 40 years has been all wrong? It has been all wrong. So Leanne, you heard him say that their failed policies and failed practices I would say, when I look at this, I think it's doing precisely what it was designed to do. Now, he talks about some of the issues. He says it's given us a costly, bloated prison system, but also one that has failed to curtail Americans' drug habits. Right. Absolutely, it's had absolutely no effect over 41 years on drug abuse. But that's not its purpose, I think. And when we look at this, we have to say that not only has it not failed to keep people from getting addicted to drugs, not only has it given us a prison system where we've got more people incarcerated, many times more proportionally per population than we have in China or in Russia, these authoritarian regimes. Uh, we have more people than any society has ever put into prison. But it's got some other issues, too. Well, let me talk about the other problems of prohibition. Of course, we've got a corrupted law enforcement in the courts. If you're going to have a war on drugs, you need an army to fight that war. So we've got militarized police. We've got courts that ignore the rule of law, ignored our due process, came up with this fiction that they call civil asset forfeiture, where they don't have to charge you with a crime, they don't have to convict you without punishing you, taking your property. Instead, what they do is they charge the property with being an accessory to the crime. Wow. So we see uh, the United States versus $5,000 of cash, or the United States versus a Learjet serial number such and such. Not against a person because, wow. you know, uh, cash and Learjets don't have any civil rights. Right. And they're ignoring our civil rights when they take our property. That kind of fiction is a product of prohibition. Of course, they're giving a lucrative monopoly to organized crime. And they're also, as a result of that, they're increasing the variety and the intensity of the drugs. We saw this happen with uh, prohibition during alcohol, that the variety and the intensity of the alcohol, as well as the Purity. You had a lot of uh, bathtub uh, gin and things that would make people go blind when they use it. We see the same sort of thing happening now. We would not have the meth epidemic if it weren't for drug prohibition. Mm. And so all of these things are things that have come out of prohibition. But 
the fact that we even have somebody that we call the drug czar, that was a sign from the very beginning, this is going in the wrong direction. Right. We don't have czars in a free society. And as long as we have a czar in a free society, we're not going to be a free society. Interestingly enough, that term was first used in the media by Joe Biden in 1982, six years before they passed the law and Reagan signed it into law that created this office, the uh, National Drug Control Policy uh, Office as part of the White House. Uh, and it was uh, the first one was William Bennett under uh, George H.W. Bush. So, you know, this has got a long history to it. Now, the interesting thing, too, about this guy is that he's someone who comes from a background of addiction. And so what he's doing is he's trying to push this towards a, uh, a treatment uh, mm -hmm. issue as opposed to a law enforcement issue. Right. But he, and he's taking it right up to the edge here because one of the conditions of this uh, office that he's in control of is that by law, the drugs are must oppose any attempt to legalize drugs. OK, he must oppose any uh, study or any funding of a study that would show that there's a legitimate use of any of the drugs that are on Schedule 1. How did these drugs get on Schedule 1? And this is what the Republicans need to understand, because by and large, they are the ones who are pushing this war on drugs. Republicans need to understand something that even though, Leanne, you point out, I've been against this for decades because I've seen what it's done to our law enforcement, to our courts, what it's done to me personally in terms of having to pay to incarcerate people for decades in prison for nonviolent crime. I don't like any of that stuff. I don't like to see our country turned into what it's been turned into with this war on drugs. But something I didn't realize until just about six months ago was that this was a UN agenda, like UN Agenda 21. It was created by the UN along with these four drug schedules in 1961, 10 years before Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs in 1971 and put it out there along with these four schedules copied verbatim from the UN agenda. So conservatives need to understand this program was designed to fail from the very beginning. It was designed to create a militarized, centralized police force. It was designed to subvert the Bill of Rights and the Constitution from the very beginning, and that's precisely what it's done. Wow, and that's incredible. And so what do you think about his take that, you know, we need to not obviously legalize marijuana, that's putting this wrong idea out there that it's safe, that it's okay. Meanwhile, you look at legalized uh, prescription drugs, which are killing more people mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. heroin or cocaine or things like that. And these are, we're give, being given the impression that th these are perfectly safe and they're okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also, you know, that, that's two things that he can't do is he can't uh, do any studies to attempt to legalize or to show there's useful stuff with things that are in Schedule One. And when you're talking about uh, prescription drugs and the FDA, they cannot, um, uh, they have to resist uh, any drug that's not been approved by the FDA. So you mm. see, we've taken a situation where we had freedom and decisions in our lives, and they have perverted it so that everything is prohibited unless expressly permitted by the FDA. Right. And now they're bringing in the other side of that, saying that since you have no control over the medicines that you take and what you do, you have no informed consent, essentially. Now they apply that to vaccines. Mm -hmm. See, it's an entire, the entire spectrum falls into this. You lose your due process of law. You corrupt law enforcement by turning them into thieves, literally highway robbers, taking people's cars or cash on the road without charging them with a crime or finding them guilty. And then you, you turn people into slaves of the pharmaceutical companies. And we know that there are so many people who die of pharmaceutical use, using it as right. advertised. You see Chris Christie come out and talk about how he wants a more compassionate approach, essentially saying the same thing this guy's talking about. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're not going to get rid of the war on drugs. They're not going to get rid of the law enforcement aspect of it. They'll talk about that as being a problem, but they want their cake and have, they want to eat their cake and have it too. So they're going to keep that there. Right. At the same time, they want to add some additional government programs that will involve addiction treatment and that sort of thing. They have, with Obamacare, uh, made everybody uh, get coverage for addiction. Right. Again, it's a tax on me. I can control myself without law enforcement. I can control myself by not getting involved with this. I always have my entire life. I don't do drugs. I didn't did alcohol. I don't do marijuana. I don't do any of this stuff. But I have to pay for people who are locked up in prison. I resent that. I resent the fact that I have to pay for an insurance policy that covers me for an addiction that I don't ever uh, have to worry about doing because I'm right. not going to take it. So we come back to this complete government control. Right. And, you know, not to mention that um, a lot of times that they're giving people like methadone or something to help them come off of drugs yes. that people end up getting even more addicted to. Those drugs make it out to the street. Uh, parents 
in their medicine cabinet, their kids can get into the medicine cabinet and then take those things to school, sell them to school. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, it's just like sort of a dangerous precedent out there. What are we doing about that? Why is it a plant that's, you know, the number one thing putting people in prisons?